I'm Katie Wood and today we're here at the Fairview Mental Hospital which is currently under reconstruction into a residential and commercial area called Pringle Creek Community. Um, today we're talking with Dean DeSantis who is owner and president of DeSantis Landscaping. Hi Dean, how are you doing today? Great, thanks. Wonderful. Um, so what is so special about this commercial project that you have going on here? Well it's, um, it's primarily a residential project. We've got 140 home lots that are being built here um, and it's I think it's probably one of the greenest projects not only in the state but probably in the country. It's uh, uh, 32 acres and they've really focused on uh, the, the natural beauty of the site and, and keeping it as pristine and, and green as possible. And another big part is water conservation, right? We're thinking about how to use water and reuse water and definitely, things definitely. Like that. That's been something. There's actually no stormwater system in the entire community. Um, it all uh, we've done. All, there's all sorts of studies that have been done to show you know how much water the the soil can take. Well, let's go check some of these areas out. All right. Sounds great. So here we are at one of your rain gardens. What mm -hmm. is actually the function of a rain garden here? Well, the rain gardens are part of the, the stormwater management system that we've got going uh, here at Pringle Creek. Um, at every intersection, there are eight of these, two at each corner, um, and they handle any of the, the runoff that isn't uh, absorbed through the porous asphalt pavement. Um, and what we've got, the, the plants in here are, are your, your typical native wetland plants um, that you'd see in any bog, boggy kind of area. Um, around Oregon. Uh, they're, they're mainly they're rushes and sedges that are in the rain garden. And what is the soil that you have them planted here? Is this a special mixture or Actually it's the it's the native topsoil. We've um, we've got a stockpile of the native topsoil that uh, that's been excavated out and we've we've stockpiled that and we're putting that now back into uh, this rain garden. There's uh, the way it's built is there there's about 12 to 18, 18 inches of drain rock and then we've got another 12 to 18 inches of soil on top of that. So it's, it's got great drainage um, and can handle a lot of water. In, in a year or so, this thing is gonna, is gonna be completely full of, of grasses um, throughout the entire uh, swale here. It's, it's really just a small swale. Okay. Mm -hmm. So earlier you mentioned the roads. There's something mm -hmm. special about these roads. It's not your typical pavement. What did you call it before? It's porous asphalt. Porous and asphalt. Uh, yeah, this, it, uh, the water when it hits the pavement, uh, typically, and this is one of the biggest problems in an urban area, residential street, is that you've got so much runoff of the asphalt. And with porous asphalt, the water just percolates right down through the asphalt and into the soil. So let me, let me show you a little bit here. A yeah, a little demonstration here. Wow. There it goes. You know, with the creek over here, we don't have water, you know, being diverted and, and run into a, a creek or waterways, which is which is fairly typical in, in other developments. Uh, so this, in combination with the rain gardens, uh, is we're able to handle all the all the natural rainwater don't right get that here in the street. Puddling and exactly small lakes forming in mm -hmm. people's yards. Right. Yeah. Um, Typically, you'd have like a street sweeper. Well, here they'll have a street vacuum because if you get uh, too much dirt and soil into the, the pavement, it's gonna clog up the street and, uh, and, and that's, that's gonna not allow the, the drainage. So they'll be sucking the dirt out of this pavement. Okay. Yeah. So this is Pringle Creek development. Um, obviously there's a creek that runs through it and you're now currently planting plants along this. Why exactly mm -hmm. are you doing that? What is its purpose? This is the riparian area uh, that we're planting right here. And as you can kind of see, it just used to be just, you know, Himalayan blackberries that are growing up here. And so we've come in and we've, we've cut down those invasive plants and we're, we're planting with a, a native, native uh, planting. So we've got things like red alder and western red cedar and some willows that are in here. And those are the plants that are, that are accustomed to the, the amount of rainfall we get here and, and just the, the climate that we've got in, in uh, the Willamette Valley. Um, so this is also, this will grow up and be a, a pretty solid, um, almost a, a hedgerow along this here. It'll be a great habitat for, for birds and for, uh, for small mammals. Um, it, uh, uh, it'll be something where the, the water will be able to, um, it'll filter through that riparian area before it gets to the creek. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of benefits of it. And what about those invasive plants? Are those going to continue to be a problem? Yeah, this the blackberry year? right here is going to be right back in the springtime, and uh, we of course didn't want to spray right near the the creek here. So um, that's it's going to be a maintenance issue, and it always is with a, a riparian area like that. So we'll be in here clearing that out once the blackberries um, grow back up and 
eventually the natives will be a little, they'll be stronger and established and we'll be able to uh, control the invasives uh, just with the plantings there. And over here on the left, we have another little trench going on. What's happening mm -hmm. over here on this side of the road? This is actually an overflow that when the, the creek rises very quickly when, when you get a heavy rainfall. And so the, the pathway here is low enough that the creek flows over into this overflow. Um, and so we're doing the same kind of planting along here, um, the same native plantings. Um, and part of it is, you know, the, the benefits of the riparian area that I just mentioned, but also just from a safety perspective, uh, you've got a walking path that's being put in here. And, you know, if kids are riding their bikes or something, that, that's a pretty steep bank. So we want to create a, a buffer there so that kids don't uh, fall and slip down into the, into the swale. So all over the site, you have these tubes popping up, and this is the end of the irrigation, right? Or yeah, this is actually where the um, we'll connect the the head, the irrigate the sprinkler head, uh, onto this uh, what we call a funny pipe, um, and that that pipe can move around so we can place our head right where we want it. This whole system is really pretty pretty unique in that it's a uh, it's an irrigation and also it's a geothermal heating and cooling system. It's kind of a hybrid. In the background here, you can see that the smokestack back there. Right at the base of that is a well that uh, pumps about 250 gallons a minute. And so what we've designed here is a system that uh, pumps out of the well, goes into the homes and the commercial buildings uh, to be used for heating and cooling. It goes through a geothermal heat pump. It's not hot water that we're pulling up out of the, out of the ground, but the heat pump actually takes the energy from the water and creates hot air or cold air um, for the homes and commercial buildings. And then when it does, does its job there, it, go, it exits the home or building and goes into our irrigation system, which waters the plants and the turf and everything. And what's not used for the irrigation goes back into an injection well and back into the aquifer uh, and kind of closes the loop. There's kind of a, a double use of the water. Another benefit, uh, you know, we've minimized the use of PVC. Uh, we've basically used 50% of the PVC that we would normally use with two standalone systems. Um, so we've saved a, a lot of, as well as uh, a huge energy savings by, you know, combining the two systems. So here we are at one of your mature landscapes that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, this is Pringle Creek. Explain to us how, how do you use this creek in the landscape to really help the plants grow and what happens when the creek overflows and things like that? Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, really, the, the, the creek is, we view it as a, you know, a, a real a, an awesome feature in the landscape. And, um, but it does, yeah, when it rains real heavily, the, the creek rises up very quickly. Um, and so we've got areas over here that used to just flood out over the, the turf um, and flood plants. And we've created a, a dry, dry creek bed um, so to handle that overflow and uh, direct more of the water back into the, the, the creek bed okay. itself. Mm -hmm. um, from the plants, the fertilization up on the yard and mm -hmm. in the lawn, does that affect the creek at all or pollute it or anything like that? Or Very much so. That's really one of the biggest problems that we've got in the Willamette Valley. In, in, in the Willamette River, a lot of, you know, is the runoff from you know, golf courses and farms and, and homes uh, with the, the fertilizers and pesticides running off into our, into our waterways. And so on this property, we haven't used any pesticides or synthetic fertilizers for over two years. And if, as you look around, you just, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing because most people Ow. think of it as <laughs> like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, if I don't use and Roundup to kill those weeds, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a weed patch. In the fertilization, you also have something called compost tea. Mm -hmm. I understand what right, exactly yeah. is compost tea. How does that help? Compost tea is a, it's kind of a, a, a blend, it's a brew, literally, of um, lots of the, the good biological critters that are, that are in the soil. One of the keys to good landscaping and good sustainable landscaping is to have um, good soil conditioning. If you've got a really packed, compacted soil, you're not gonna get good drainage. Your water is going to be um, is going to puddle and, and run off. If you've got a nice, um, a good soil that's that's got good biology, those little critters are creating little tunnels through there and creating better drainage. How do you find out what type of soil you have or what type of compost tea you need? Is there someone mm -hmm. you can talk to, or yeah, there, how there, does that work? Yeah, there are soil labs, and um, that we use soil labs ourselves. We, you know, we take a soil sample, and they give you a little bag that you can send to the lab, and so they they come back with a, a soil analysis that tells you, you know, the different elements that you've got in your soil, which would then tell you, you know, what 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 additives you might need in, into your soil, and. Uh, when we actually brew compost tea, we take that soil sample and, that, and we can brew a tea to exactly match what the soil needs. So we can um, uh, bring it back to 
you know, a, a good balance. Essentially, it's a big tea bag. It's a big cylinder that goes into a 500 gallon brewer and it's aerated, so the water just goes around and it's basically like tea, it's steeping. Uh -huh. And so the, all the, the good stuff is coming out of that compost and creates uh, this uh, really powerful, uh, good biological <laughs> potion, essentially, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, how uh -huh. cool. Yeah. So a new term that has been thrown out there in landscaping business mm -hmm. is zeroscaping. What exactly is that? Yeah, great question. Xeriscaping is, um, you know, a lot of people, when they think about xeriscaping, they think of cactuses and rock gardens and things like that. And that, that's xeriscaping, but it really fits more for the Southwest. Mm -hmm. Here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we can do xeriscaping. And really, xeriscaping is about minimizing inputs, water, fertilizers. Um, like if we look along the creek here, we can see some of the native plantings along here, the dogwoods and the, and the willows. Um, but mixed in with some ornamentals to give some color, because some, you know, xeriscaping here in the Northwest can still be green and lush, but you're not going to get a whole lot of color with the blooms and things like that. Uh, so we, you know, what we've done here is mix, mix in some of those ornamentals to give us that, the blooms. Do the <laughs> ornamental plants attract more pests than the native plants or how does that work? That's, that's a great point. Yes. The um, native plants are much more pest resistant. Again, they're, they're native to this area and, and they're accustomed to the, to the climate and conditions. Um, but our native plants um, can really, uh, they can handle, uh, more of those wet conditions like we have here in the Northwest, just beyond those dogwood, sort of a reedy uh, rush plant, and that does real well along stream beds and in wetland areas. Um, so plantings like that, um, they're native, they, they like this, the wet conditions, um, and they don't need any uh, fertilizers. It's the, it's, it's the right plant for the right place. So you mentioned microclimates. Um, if we've got a really hot spot in a landscape that's full sun, well that's gonna, that's gonna uh, necessitate different types of plants than if you've got a real shady area that's in maybe a forest. Um, you've got to, you know, you really need to look at that and good design, it all starts with good design. You need to be looking at, you know, your microclimates, the soil type, um, all of that goes into a good xeriscape plan. Another important part of yard management is, of course, watering, but we're talking about water conservation. So today I'm speaking with Brent Stevenson from DeSantis Landscapes. And Brent, you are the Irrigation Division Manager of DeSantis Landscapes, correct? Yes, correct. All right, and um, in irrigating a yard, what, how do you make it efficient so you're not wasting a bunch of water? What are things that you want to look for and think about? Well, some of the most important things are, uh, first off, is understanding the soil characteristics of where you're applying the water, um, and then looking at the ultimate goal of the landscapes. Um, for example, on this site, we're using a highly efficient drip irrigation. Um, we're irrigating each individual plant instead of a spray head or some other um, manner. That way you don't get water that's over applied and running off and you see it uh, many areas where water's running over the sidewalk and down the street. How do you know how much water is needed? This site is um, a little more uh, high tech. We actually have an on-site weather station that monitors wind and temperature and humidity. And by that, we can calculate the amount of use that water or the plants we require. From the field here, it radio transmits back to a main point at the house, and then it's connected to a phone line that's then tied to our office. And we can turn the system at any point on and off from our office. The system doesn't turn on during a rainy period. Also, in the early spring, you can monitor and reduce the amount that you apply instead of just turning it on and having it apply the full summertime rate. And that concludes our little tour of the microclimates and yard management with water conservation. Just wanted to thank Dean, Brent, thank you so much for being with us today. It was our pleasure. I had a great time, thank you. Thanks. And I'm Katie Wood bringing you the tools today to make you more sustainable.